welcome to visitors and those who are worshiping with us online. It is good uh, to be back together again. Finally, it has been um, a long time since I have seen most of you. Uh, an unexpected detour for me after Christmas and with the ice last week, um, I did want to say a special thank you to Deb Ryerson, who is somewhere. Oh, there she is. Uh, for helping out um, the Sunday that I was on vacation when uh, Bill Beck was sick, and then the Sunday that I was uh, quarantined. Uh, much appreciated, uh, Deb. Thank you. Um, there are some announcements in the bulletin. A reminder that the office is closed uh, for tomorrow, and that session meets on Tuesday evening, uh, men's breakfast on Thursday of this week. Also a reminder that uh, choir is not uh, rehearsing or singing uh, for the next couple of weeks because of the COVID surge and also that uh, fellowship hour is um, on pause for the month of January. Uh, the prayer community is meeting today uh, after worship as well. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Let us worship God. share 
and we support people that need or want or are hungry. So we came up with the idea for our, our winter mission. We're going to have a Super Bowl here at First Presbyterian Church on February 13th. And you all are invited to attend. There will be soup after worship for everyone that comes. But we would like you to show, show your uh, team colors. And if you're an NFC, AFC or an NFC um, fan, whichever your team is, we will have goalposts set up today um, after church. It, and we will build our soup under the goalpost to see which team here at First Presbyterian Church, which conference is going to win. So as it goes on, you can vote for your team. We hope you'll wear your favorite football jersey on that day, um, it, whether your team's in it or not, just for fun. And um, we, we just look forward to supporting Project Share. Project Share, you can bring Progresso Soup, Campbell Soup, or Store Brand Soup. Project Share will not care but we care about feeding the hungry. So please help us support this mission and put your soup under uh, each goal, whatever goalpost you want to support. And if you don't want to shop or you're concerned to shop, you know, with the, with the pandemic, we understand that, you can ask any deacon to shop for you or there will be a soup pot in the middle that you can put a cash or check donation for Project Share. If you have any questions, speak to a deacon or ask, uh, call me. I'll be happy to talk to you about it more if you want any more information. But we hope you all come out on Super Bowl Sunday, and we'll see who wins the Presbyterian Super Bowl before the real Super Bowl.
we say that we are without sin. We do deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In penitence and faith, therefore, let us pray together. You are a God of grace and good gifts. Forgive us when we do not recognize your grace, when we do not hear your spirit calling and challenging us. Forgive us when we do not live as people of grace, when we are quick to judgment and slow to compassion. Forgive us when we do not believe the depth of your grace, when we doubt whether we are good enough. Dear brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ is in that position. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ, therefore, is a new creation. Behold, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. <laughs> So shall your builder 
marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. From the New Testament, the scripture reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is the story of Jesus' first miracle at the wedding in Cana. Listen again to God's word. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and fill them up. He said to them, Now draw out some, and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom, and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week I spoke to you about Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist and the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, a ministry that, of course, as we know, has changed the course of human history and touched countless lives. We might take a moment to think about some of these people who were changed by their interactions with Jesus. We see them scattered throughout the New Testament. The blind man who regained his sight, the bleeding woman who was healed, the leper who was cured, the paralytic who began to walk, the deaf man who could hear again. There were the men and women afflicted by demons that Jesus drove out. And then consider Lazarus, Jesus' friend and disciple, who was dead and buried and gone, how Jesus raised him up from the grave and restored his life. All of these people were transformed by their experiences with Jesus. They were lost, but Jesus found them. They were blind, but he gave them sight. They were weak, they were tired, they were weary, and Jesus gave them rest. 
They were outcasts and sinners, and Jesus welcomed them in. This morning's Gospel lesson tells the story of Jesus' very first miracle. John calls it his first sign, but it's a miracle. And it's not exactly what we might be expecting. Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine at a pretty raucous wedding. Now this is a story about transformation, yes, but not the kind of transformation that we perhaps come to expect from Jesus. Healing the sick, sure. Sight to the blind, absolutely. Enabling the deaf to hear, yes. But turning water into wine at what seems like a pretty wild wedding reception, that's not the kind of transformation that we're expecting. As I was reading and thinking about this passage, I kept coming back to the idea of transformation. Yes, Jesus turns the water into wine, and apparently it is really good wine. But that can't just be what this story is about. It's not just about Jesus helping to keep the party going for a bit longer. There's more to this passage. As we think about transformation, we can't help but Consider the transformations we experience in our own lives. Sometimes those transformations are fast, like a bolt of lightning. But more often than not, they are so slow that it's hard for us to notice them. I was thinking about transformation this week in my office, and as I was thinking, my eye landed on the picture that is on one of my bookshelves. It's a picture from my ordination day almost 14 years ago. And I looked at the faces in that picture. I can't remember what I was thinking. Probably you don't have a clue what you've gotten yourself into or something like that. But I was looking at all of those faces and remembering those special people. Some of them have gone on to be with the Lord. Some of them, I don't even know where they are now. We've all been transformed. I noticed it because my hairline has receded significantly in those 14 years. That's not a transformation I was glad to see. But it's not something that I would notice just by looking at my hair in the mirror every day when I comb it after getting out of the shower. It's a slow process. Transformations are often like that, slow. Sometimes they don't seem to show any progress at all until one day you catch a glimpse of yourself in the mirror and look at an old photo at the same time and you realize that yes, you have been changed. You have been transformed. Transformation can be slow. It can also be painful. The story of God's people is, above all else, a story of transformation. From very early in the scriptures, we see God interacting with his people, transforming them, conforming them to his image. The story of redemption begins as the story of rebellion. Right? God's people rebel against their creator. The one in whose image they are made, in whose image we are made. The people of God rebel and sin distorts their view of the world, their understanding of God. And they run from God and pursue their own desires. And yet God remains stories of the prophets in the Bible, God sends them to call his beloved people back again and again and again. God calls through the prophets, calling his people back to a right relationship. But the 
people reject God's gentle, patient call. When all seems lost, God sends his people away into exile, far from the land, far from the temple, far from everything they have ever known and loved. And it doesn't look good until we remember that God sends them away with a promise. And the promise is that one day you will come home. One day you will come back to the land. One day you will come back to the temple and it will be rebuilt. One day your relationship with God will be transformed. Restored. <clears throat> Isaiah says this about it, the nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name. God says through the prophet, you shall no longer be termed forsaken, for that's surely how the people felt. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. The Lord delights in you. The Lord delights in you. Think about that for a moment. The Lord delights in you. Delights in seeing you, in hearing you. Delights in your prayers. Delights in your presence. Delights in you. God's transformation, you see, is big time. God is not content for his people to remain as they are in exile. There is a better future for God's people beyond exile. There is a better future for us as well. There is a better future for us because we are still part of this narrative. We are part of this narrative that begins all the way back at the beginning of Genesis and continues on through the Gospels and the Epistles right down to the present day. The story of God continually transforming God's people in the Bible, it is also our story. We are participants in this transformation as well. Because transformation is what Jesus is all about. That's what he comes to do. Jesus comes preaching the nearness of God's kingdom. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim a message of release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If that's not transformation, I don't know what is. Jesus' very first miracle is a miracle of transformation. He's at a wedding reception in Cana, about eight or nine miles from his hometown in Nazareth. And Jesus is at this wedding with some of his disciples, he's already called a few of them, and some of his family is also there. Because when the host runs out of wine, all of a sudden Jesus' mother comes to him and says, you've got to do something about this. They have no more wine, she tells her son. Jesus' response to his mother, to Mary, is either amusing or alarming, depending on how you read it. Is Jesus being terse with Mary when he says, what does that to do with me and with you? Is he being terse or is he simply telling her there's nothing that he can do about it? It's not his party. Somebody else needs to be responsible for the wine. My hour is not yet come. In either case, Jesus is resisting Mary's encouragement to do something to prolong the party. But we don't know why. Is he waiting for some sort of divine revelation? 
Does he not know what to expect? Or does he just want to enjoy himself at the party and not have to worry about helping with the catering? The story is simple, it's straightforward for the most part. Jesus then tells some of the servants who are there to fill up the water jars that are part of this home. These water jars that are usually used for purification rituals. Huge stone jars that would have held somewhere between 20 and 30 gallons of water. And so that's what the servants do. They listen to Mary and they listen to Jesus and they fill up these water jars with water. And after they fill the jars, the liquid is drawn out and taken to the chief steward and sampled and found to be wine. The chief steward is, is concerned and confused because this isn't any ordinary wine. It's not the cheap stuff that you would serve after everybody's already had a few. It's exceedingly good wine, the kind that hosts would ordinarily serve first at a wedding. And then, after everyone had been enjoying themselves, no one was feeling any pain, the host would bring out the cheaper stuff. Because who would know the difference by that point? But the chief steward says, this wine, it's first rate, it's top notch, it's good stuff. And the chief steward and the bridegroom are both confused. They don't understand how this has happened. They don't understand because they didn't see what happened. In fact, no one sees the transformation that takes place in those stone jars. It's not like dyeing the Chicago River green on St. Patrick's Day. You know, in that case, we can see the dye being dumped into the river. Here in Cana Valley, the water just becomes wine. The Greek text is incredibly straightforward. It literally translates the water wine became. It just happened. But the miracle is only realized or tasted in the results. There's no flash or bang. It's just a simple glass of wine. The chief steward and the bridegroom are confused. They don't understand. They don't know that they are talking about a miracle. It's only the serpents who fill the jars who know the true origin of the wine. And the disciples who are gathered around Jesus, they have it figured out. They know what Jesus has done, that he has turned the water into wine. And the text says that because of this miracle, they believed. They believed. How often do we miss out on God's transformations because we are thinking like the chief steward and the bridegroom? They're looking for a logical explanation. But there seems to be little logic in the glory Jesus reveals. The Son of God comes to earth in order to serve others instead of being served himself. The Son of God comes to give his life in order that we may receive eternal life. And sometimes that transformation is hard to see. It's not exactly what we're looking for. There are no fireworks and parades. The Christian life is so often made up of small, quiet steps are hard to notice, not unlike a baby born in a manger in some out-of-the-way town far away long ago. Jesus continues the story of God's transformation that winds its way through Scripture, through the stories of God's people. Turning water into good wine indicates the extravagant provision Jesus points to in the age that is to come. 
this story of biblical transformation, it continues right down to today. God is not content to leave us as we are. God is not content to leave us as we are. God faithfully called the people of Israel back, and so too God continues to call us back. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God continues to transform us, to mold us, to shape us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior that we might be perfect people of God. Because we're not finished models, any of us. We're not finished models. No one here today knows everything there is to know. <clears throat> no one here today knows everything there is to know about God. No one knows how to pray perfectly, and none of us completely understands the Bible. None of us know how to fully love our neighbor or to turn the other cheek or to live in peace. None of us are completely, totally, 100% good and perfect and proficient at those things. That is why we are always in need of God's transforming grace. That is why we, as Christians, can be a sign and witness of transformation in a world that is so often wracked with warfare and violence and greed and hatred and injustice, bitterness and division. Just as we ourselves are transformed by God, so we can help transform the world around us by sharing the love of Jesus Christ. In his letter to the church at Rome, Paul said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and acceptable, perfect. We most often hear this verse when someone is talking about what a, what a wicked, horrible place this world is. But what if we looked at it a little differently in light of this transformation miracle of the King of Galilee? If we looked at the long line of transformation witnessed in the scriptures, joyfully accepted our part in the ongoing story of God's redemptive work, transforming our lives, transforming this world. Who are we to say that we don't need to be transformed? We all need to be transformed. Transformation is all around us. Sometimes it's hard to see. Sometimes it's plain as the nose on your face. But I want to encourage you to be diligent and purposeful seeing and accepting God's transformative power at work in your own life and in the life of the church. How is God at work in your life? How is God at work in the life of the church? Maybe it is something that's been completely unexpected. We have been walking through difficult waters the past two years now. We trust that better days are ahead. Today we ordain and install new officers, men and women who have heard God's call and answered it willingly to serve the church in this place. They will be transformed by their service, but they don't know it yet. No matter where we go in life, no matter what we go through, in life. We have the assurance given to us by Jesus that God is with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. That God is with us transforming us. And it's not usually very easy. Transformation can be painful and it can be lengthy. A rose bush doesn't look very pretty after it has been pruned 
But just wait until the following summer and what happens? You will see the yield and increase of blossoms. And so, dear brothers and sisters, it is with us. Transformation takes time. But the end product, like good wine at a wedding banquet, is good and full of God's grace and God's truth. Thanks be to God. Amen. Cards and calls um, 
um, she is most grateful for that as well. Uh, and we also pray for Marsha and Lee Kratzang. Uh, Marsha's mother, Helen Van Dyke, died earlier this week. And so we pray uh, for them as well. Let us join our hearts and minds together. Eternal God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you are at work in our lives, O oh God, transforming us and conforming us more and more each day to the image of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks for his life, death, and resurrection, O oh God, in which we are saved. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we are saved by Christ's death and resurrection through faith that we might share our faith, that we might share the good news which has so impacted us with those around us and share your love. Lord God, as we come into your house this day, we come as your people. We come bringing with us all that we carry this life, our fears, our worries, our joys, our tears, all that we have, we bring with us, O oh God. Some of us carry exceedingly heavy burdens, O oh God, and you know that. And we rejoice, Jesus, that you invite us to lay down our burdens, instead to carry yours, to walk with you in this life, to be your faithful disciple. Lord, may each of us in this life realize that our burdens can be laid at your throne of grace, and that in Christ we have a burden that is light and easy. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk faithfully and to walk with him. We lift our prayers to you this day, O oh God, remembering so much in our lives and in the life of the world. Continue to pray for people in Texas, especially at the synagogue there that was the scene of such stress uh, yesterday, O oh God. And we give thanks that it ended without violence. We give thanks uh, for all of the uh, police and law enforcement who were able to bring the hostages out safely. We pray, Lord, for so many other concerns in this life. We pray for people who are struggling and suffering, for those who are hungry and those who are fearful, those who don't know where their next meal will come from or where they will lay their head this night. We pray, O oh Lord, that as you have moved toward us in grace, as you have blessed us in this life, we may in turn share our blessings with others. We pray this day for Bill and for Rita, that you would be with them. We pray for Barb and for her time in rehab. We pray for Lee and Marcia and for their comfort. Give them peace and hope in the resurrection at this time. As we prepare to ordain and install officers today, O oh God, we give thanks for these men and women who have answered your call. We give thanks, O oh God, that they have said yes to your service. And we pray that you would bless them in their service in the days, and weeks, and months, and years ahead. We pray all of these things, O oh God, trusting in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
time, I would like to invite only those who are being ordained as deacons or elders to come forward and to space yourselves out in front of the congregation. Uh, those who are being installed, I'll ask you to remain at your seats and we'll ask you to stand uh, at a, a certain time. Uh, and for those who would normally come forward for the laying on of hands, you can come forward. Um, we will um, ask you to remain uh, in your, your seats and, and lift your hands uh, at an appropriate time. In scripture, we hear these words. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ, and individually members of we are all called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the Church, some are called to service as deacons, some as elders, and some as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the Church, assuring that his ministry continues among us providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of the First Presbyterian Church now ordains Megan Crum, Susan McKinnon, to the office of deacon, and Denise Kelly, Richard Bressler to the office of elder and installs them to active service on their respective boards. The session also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained. That includes deacons Susan Paglio, Rita Beck, Tracy Summers, and Dennis and Connie Hustler, and elders Lynn Barr, Fred Seltzer, Charlie Thompson, Bruce Bailey, and Carlton. Ordination calls the whole church to renewed commitment and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule and affirming the faith of the church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? So say, I do. I do. This is for everybody. <laughs> do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Dear brothers and sisters who are being ordained and installed today, the grace bestowed on you in baptism is sufficient for your calling, and because it is God's grace, it is for you. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in faith and to commit our lives in ways which serve Christ and his church. God has called you to particular service. Show your purpose by answering these questions. And those who are being installed uh, today can also stand at this time where you are. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the Church Universal, and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our Church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I do, and I will. I do. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, say, I will. I will. To the deacons who are being ordained and installed today, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. And to the elders who are being ordained and installed today, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. I will. And some questions for the congregation as a whole. Do we, the members of the church, accept Susan, Rita, Tracy, Megan, Suzanne, Connie, and Dennis <coughs> as deacons, and Lynn, Denise, Fred, Charlie, Richard, Bruce, and Carlton as elders, all chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. If so, we say, we do. We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, say, we do. We do. Ordinarily, we would have all ordained elders come forward at this time for the laying on of hands, but that's not safe or appropriate. And so if you are an ordained elder, I invite you to uh, lift up your hand and to uh, pray with us as we ordain uh, these folks today. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called for leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors and teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the seventy elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on these deacons, that they may be faithful deacons in the church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they may see and serve wherever there is need. Train them in the school of prayer, that they may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, 
the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel into the halls of power and to communicate your presence and might among those who are powerless. In everything, give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant for your reign. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on these elders, that they may be your faithful elders in the church. Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this session and in every court of the church that they may be servant leaders, following Christ who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in their walk of faith, and a sure sense of your abiding presence for the work of ministry. Gracious God, through the waters of baptism, you have claimed us as your own, and called us to share in Christ's ministry. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we may discern the gifts you have given, calling them forth from one another, and together use these gifts for the good of all. In obedience to Christ and in the unity of his spirit, may we proclaim good news, make disciples, be light and leaven, share our bread, offer a cup of cold water, and wash one another's feet. Make us strong in Christ to live as your people and show forth your saving love in the world the power of the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. Dear ones, all of you who are standing, you are now deacons and elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Some of you are brand new and some of you have served many times. And whatever the case, I say to you, welcome to this ministry. remain at the doors today as you leave and of all the other ways that you are able to uh, give to support the work of the church either online or through the mail or dropping donations off of the church thank you for your continued generosity and support let us give thanks to God holy God you are the giver of all good things from you all blessings flow. Out of the abundance of your blessings, we offer you our gifts. They can bless our gifts and our lives, your use, your purposes in this world. And may you reign of love, reconciliation, hope, and peace be extended.
have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.